Hello, everyone, and welcome to Poetry at Tech. I'm Travis Denton, and I have the pleasure to serve as the Associate Director of Poetry at Tech uh, for these 14 years or so. And thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, though we still can't be together in the Cress Auditorium in the Paper Tricentennial Building at Georgia Tech, it's, it's wonderful that we can come together in this virtual environment to celebrate community building through the arts and our shared humanness through the craft of poetry. During our previous two events this fall, we're glad to say that there are so many who would not have been able to join us physically because of geography. Uh, even if we were able to meet in person, uh, but who have been able to join us now from many parts of the United States and abroad. Just uh, uh, tonight, we have folks joining us from New York, folks from Orlando, folks from Kansas, Illinois, California. Thank you. If this is your first time at Poetry at Tech, we give you a warm welcome. Thanks for being here, and we're glad to have you. Um, we're glad you can join us from your living rooms, your front porches, your kitchen tables, uh, in your pajamas, your slippers. Uh, you know, whatever floats your boat, we're just glad you're here. But tonight we have two dynamic poets with us, Victoria Chang and Georgia Tech's own Professor J.C. Riley. Uh, both poets have brand new collections. Both poets are dear friends. Um, Ilya Kaminsky will be along in just a few minutes to give uh, them a proper introduction. That'll come up in just a few minutes. But uh, for now, it's the season when we all stop for, for a moment of thanks, and, and that's especially true for tonight. I want to give a, a hearty thanks to the family of Margaret and Henry Seaborn and to Bruce McEver, whose gifts and generosity created Poetry at Tech some 20 years ago. That's right, nearly 20 years ago. And here we are uh, as the program continues to grow and increase its outreach in Atlanta, the Southeast, and beyond. And tonight, uh, is a special night in that it's the time of year that we award Thomas Lux Poetry Award to a Georgia Tech student poet. That's right, it's one of my favorite times of the year. And tonight, we must also extend our thanks to Cheney Crow, who's actually joining us tonight, uh, for recognizing the need to create a prize that both honors Thomas Lux and in the spirit of Thomas Lux, embodied generosity of spirit, the award supports and encourages emerging Georgia Tech poets to continue to hone their craft. Cheney is a former student and dear friend of Tom's, and, and I want to recognize her tonight and say thank you for establishing this award um, that Illy and I are thrilled to award to a, a Georgia Tech poet, not once, right, not once, but twice each year in the amount of one thousand dollars. That's not chump change at all. We all know that. It's not chump change. One thousand dollars. This award has been transformative already for so many emerging poets. And, and here's more about the award. Thomas Lux uh, believed that poems are made things, just like bridges, buildings, or airplanes. Each requires planning, editing, revision, and most of all, the capacity on the part of the maker to put in the time and hard work that comes with dedication to craft that is required to create poems. For that reason, the Thomas Lux Poetry Award is meant to acknowledge a Georgia Tech poet who exemplifies that dedication to craft and willingness to put in the hard work required to not only work toward writing well-wrought poems, but who presents an extraordinary interest in studying poetry, its craft, its traditions. In the spirit of Thomas Lux's vision for teaching and writing, this award is meant to reward endeavor, not mastery of forms or overall craft. It's, it's not a poetry contest at all. A recipient's poem must present an overall clarity, accessibility, and all ambition to be toward the work itself. And, and now to the award. The fall 2020 Thomas Lux Award winner grew up in a small town called Claxton, Georgia, with approximately 2,000 people. It is from this small town that he held his first job at a local food store 
for over two years while he worked and went to school at Georgia Southern University. Uh, during this time, he became more serious in his poetry while battling the struggles of a, a low-income college student, something I know a, a lot of us uh, deal with. He used poetry as a way of expression when he had no other way to express his feelings. Two and a half years later, he transferred to Georgia Tech, where he has been for three years and has taken multiple poetry classes. He's slated to graduate from Tech this semester. When he graduates, he already has a job in the paper industry as a control engineer. He gives many thanks to his grandmother, who has always taken him and his family in in times of struggle or when they didn't have a place to live. He dedicates the poem he'll be reading tonight to her, his grandmother, and her strong will that lit a fire under him to be better graduate as the first electrical engineer in his family. Ellie and I are, are really proud to present the Thomas Lux Poetry Award to such a hardworking young poet who's dedicated to the craft, and that's, that's been clear over these months. Cheney, I know our friend Tom would be proud and and probably spout off some string of expletives in joy. And that's what I always loved about Tom as well. The fall 2020 Thomas Lux Poetry Award goes to Jameer Jones. Let's welcome and congratulate Jameer. Jameer? Hey, I'm here. <laughs> Um, thank you for this uh, word. Uh, thank you, Miss Cheney. Um, thank you to Poetry at Tech for giving me giving me the advice and tools I need to actually become a better poet. Um, it's all really appreciated. And if you guys would like, I would love to present to you this uh, poem that I've worked over through the semester. Uh, it's entitled "You Are Your Father's Son." Okay. You are your father's son. I have heard so many times. These words are fire in my chest. They blaze upon my mother's lips. They scorch her tongue to where the language she speaks becomes a cacophony of sounds. And even though she compares me to a man whose one night stand broke and shattered lamps where my light trail was dimly found, I hear her. I understand her. At least I know her. At least I can see her. At least I can touch and hug her after she wiped up my shit. Even now, I feel her presence on my waist like she was embracing my baby fat. Every foe she created and bestowed upon me like trophies granted to the winners of the New World World Series. And just like a race to home stretch, my father's sperm penetrated my mother's egg, and I saw my old man stand there as exited Sharitha. Tears dropped from his eyes in a steady drip by which a metronome could tick to the sounds of his sobs. Damn, he shrieked, another bastard added to the list, another welfare recipient for the white and black folk. Ah, how proud will they be, the people, when they see this newborn's breath. His tiny gasp will make me weep with happiness. You are your father's son. I have heard so many times these words burn the fields of love. And I tend to flames until the ground burns harder than Georgia summers and tarry tobacco plots. Smoking a cigarette reminds me of the gunk that lies behind. Flames touch my lungs, if only for a second, as I crave that warmth. Embers fall on my shirt, but I don't mind. The pretty red sparkles shine like Christ's blood in a silver wine glass. I finally flick the ashes, and it reminds me of my father. The him inside me. But I try to flick away. I have looked at my mirror's reflection, my nose like his, my face droops the same as his. Her eyes hang low like we're as, as high as the birds that whisper over our heads. They talk to me. These birds understand. They are the same birds that flocked to the south when Nat Turner rebelled from his master's hands. It seems I understand. I am not my father. I am not my father. I am his son, but I am not my father. Thank you. Jameer, thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, and 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 thank you for uh, all the hard work that you put into uh, writing those well wrought poems. Um, and uh, it, this award, I, I know, is only going to encourage you to to keep writing, keep going, and uh, keep that voice out there. It's powerful, and the world needs to hear more of that. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, guys, most definitely. And now, let's bring in Ilya Kaminsky. Let's introduce Ilya as we continue our evening of poetry with J.C. Riley and Victoria Chang. Ilya. Thank you so much, Travis, and thank you, Jameer, for this beautiful reading. Uh, this is going to be a fantastic evening of poetry with J.C. Riley and Victoria Chang, two brilliant minds whose books of poems are much larger than just collections of verse. In very different ways, they are so far reaching, imaginative, heartbreaking. Each has a moving, spellbinding story, yes, but she makes it into a song. In fact, it is truly a test of craft for most poets. Can one put together a book of poems that also tells a larger story? Many poets try and fail, but our ideas today have succeeded. And so I very much look forward to this evening of sharing their work with you. J.C. Riley has received awards from the National Federation of State Poetry Societies, the Georgia Poetry Society, Louisiana Division for the Arts, and has also been nominated for Georgia Book of the Year. Her poems have appeared in journals such as Poetry International, and she is the managing editor of the Atlanta Review. Jesse Valley is also a beloved teacher and a member of our community here at Georgia Tech. So we are thrilled to help celebrate the publication of her first full-length book, the novel in verse, What Magic May Not Alter. Which come out this year. With incredible skill, JC spins a lyric tale about the bond between two sisters, Talua and Vidalia, and their time in the turn of the century American South. The book of, is the year of the fantasy, but it deals with many things that are all too real. The often tragic history of South with KKK, murders, alcoholism, assault. There is a real charm and spell of storytelling, however, in these poems, as they create for us the world of folklore and heartbreak. As we watch the two twin sisters fall in love, conjuring future husbands, attending funerals, and wish princesses at Lion Man in the impossible world of 19th century Louisiana. Why do I love this book? It's masterfully created novel and verse, yes. But also, it's a spell book asking us to reconsider a place of magic in our lives. I love the strangeness of imagery, both folklore-like and immediate. For example, quote, What you have said becomes the pear in the sorrow, lays down in leaves like the faces of unborn peaks. I love how Riley can create a memorable character with just a few lines of verse, sometimes just a turn of phrase, quote. She would give Narcissus a run for his money, over springing in the mirror, patting at her hair, twisted up in some squirrel's nest of a nut. In the end, this book asks me why, despite all the odds, despite all the tragedies, do I, or any human for that matter, still long to believe in magic? It is a large question, and it takes a fascinating book to answer it. Please give J.C. Riley a very warm welcome.
Can you hear me now? Sorry. I'm super thrilled to be here tonight. Thank you. Um, so the poems I'm reading are from my new book. Um, as Ilya said, it came out in a April. And he gave you a little idea of what's happening. But it is about two sisters at the turn of the century. Um, and they are in a magical family. Um, so I'm going to read uh, some poems um, that are more about the narrative than um, about some of those weird images. This first poem is called The Equinox Moon, Milky Blue, Dims a Moment as Patchy Clouds Pass Underneath Toward Texas. As the sisters sway and sing in sedgegrass and creeping sticky jack, Granny Bee keeps her restless tea. They are too young yet, they're told, to invoke Astra, Bloodweth, Demeter, too young to wake, wake in resting earth, or to dance sky clad with coronets of meadowsweet in their hair, or to drink poppy physic brewed at dawn. Those things come later, when the moon impels the inner tides of blossoming women, and when the circle of mothers open and the gift becomes theirs. But tonight, promises and mysteries seem less real than the ritual of ten-year-olds, a magic chant they might have dreamed, a waltz on tippy-toes to spring. So one of the recurring motifs in my book is mythology surrounding this thing called Old Wives Oak. And the theory is if you plant a daffodil there, you will see your true love once it blooms. Um, both of the twins believe in this uh, magic, but Lula isn't happy about it, mainly because the Dahlia has planted um, her daffodil with someone in mind. This is called Old Wives Oak again. The daffodils bloomed early that year, the end of January, before the rabbits left their warrens, before the mice crept from their nests, before I knew to pluck a sister's hope, this flower that should have stayed numb in the ground to rot in its sheath the way the one for whom she planted it should lie in pine and satin by mirror hands, but I arrived too late. She, at her daily vigil, marking, measuring, praying, had seen him saunter by, the collar on his jacket turned up against the wind, the flush in his cheeks she'd always find endearing, which even then was gin's, not winter's, doing. I could not spare her once the old wives' magic struck. As dumb love clouded her eyes, fate's yellow trumpet resounded through somber bare branches like a sigh. Um, someone who read this book said, I must be a really violent person because there's a lot of violence in this book. Um, and I don't think of myself as a violent person, but they're right. There's a lot of violence. Um, and, and this poem alludes to um, domestic violence between Vidalia and the villain of the piece. So um, you are forewarned. There's violence. Ash, oh, I should also mention that, yes, they're magic, that they're witches, but they're also Catholic. So there's Catholic imagery in here, too. Ashes Wednesday. Before she turns to undress, I glimpse something bat-like round her eye. Darker than the smudge still visible on her forehead from church this morning. She does not speak. And when I move to place my hand on her shoulder, she flinches, scuttles under the blankets like a thin spooked cat, and curls toward the wall. I creep downstairs to the kitchen from Granny's herb pantry a few things, a filter of arnica oil, feverfew for tea. As the water boils, I crush calendula petals with a pestle Hold them into some cheesecloth that I wrap around a hunk of ice. Whisper, almost without thought. On your face his menace clings. A livid brown, this darkness stings. 
Tomorrow may fairer glance prevail, the falling gone, a heart that sings. I pour the water over the tea, add sugar, gather remedies on a tray. Upstairs, I sit beside Vi, pull her gently toward me. She does not resist this time, lets me apply with the arnica with fairy touch. It's pine sagey scent, easing both her and me. Her lips, ashy, accept my quick kiss. I give her the calendula compress, urge her to drink some tea. How much longer till what must be? This is called Wind Through Corn. As Lula comes to a clearing in the maze and stares overhead at horse white clouds galloping across a too blue for October sky, the wind shaking the gold queen leaves like a thousand rattlers blows a kernel of truth her way that she can't be lost. Not she who draws earth energy through her feet to her heart, to her lungs, and releases it back to creation with breath and thanks, as every sibling woman before her has done. She breaks off a cob, peels away the floss, and tosses it free. It glints like a flame, like a fairy on a fresh burst of wind, flying eastward, towards exit, towards home. Um, Kalula may not put much stock in magic, um, although it is her birthright, uh, but she's not against it either, uh, especially if it helps uh, put some people in their places. Um, this poem, this next poem, uh, introduces a character, Widow Sally, who's just a local, a local witch. There's witches all over Shreveport in my imagination in 1920s uh, Louisiana. This is Lethe's Novena. Widow Solly meets me at the barn door, a blue-black beeswax candle in her left hand, pencil and parchment in her right. Back again, Tallulah? Between you and Vi, I've got egg money to spare. The widow doesn't spare a smile. You can't forget, I reply. What I don't say, that by night she sobs till tears etch grooves in her cheeks, her eyes and nose red as the geraniums Granny Bee raises in her window boxes. That she never eats, and twice I've taken in her clothes, unsure she's noticed, even with my uncertain stitches. That she's paler than dogwood blooms by day, and restless as clouds before a storm. The widow knows this already. I have just the thing, she says, turning away, the half door shutting behind her with an almost bat-like flap. When she appears again, she carries a pouch of powder, a jar of honey, a copper bowl, bittersweet root, and nine scraps of handmade rose paper. The ritual is more important than belief to Lula, since our gift hesitates within you. On a scrap for nine nights, right. What disquiets my sister's heart erase? Bring forth the ease of even days. Forget, forget the hidden face. Release all memory of love misplaced. Nine times burn the paper in the brazier. Nine times cast the ashes to the winds. Nine times brew this poppy tea with honey. Make her drink it a shade before bedtime. Nine times touch her head with bittersweet and tuck it beneath her pillow when her anguish is as the filaments of an insect wing. Nine times smash the root beneath your heel. The dahlia will be free, but will you? I fear the vengeance that even now knots your veins shall snare you longer than this lifetime. I have something for that too, should you want it. Nine times ninety lifetimes I'll hate what's been done to buy. I take the widow's magic with me. Weave coins in her hand.
Um, it's not a Southern story until someone ends up in an asylum. So uh, here, uh, Highland um, is the sanitarium where uh, Vidalia gets uh, committed. Letter from Vidalia. Highland Sanitarium, February 1923. Oh, and I should say at the end she calls herself Lissa, but she's a little bonkers, so that's part of it. She forgets who her, her name is. Letter from Vidalia. Lula. Did you see the stars tonight? Like so many buttons on a great gray coat. The dove and dog I see at once. And then the twins, Castor and Pollux, on a long walk across the sky. I should cry, but I mustn't cry again. It's an art the white army stamps out, like the knights with their pills. Sarcasm, like whiskey under their breaths. Thanks. The coat you sent, its flowers orange as Pollux, is warm as honey slobber. All at once, the gas lamps surge in their sconces and dim, the way house lights start to flicker at intermission's ends. All clocks tell a lie it's ten, but it's eight at night when they call bedtime. Check petticoats and pillows for anything sharp. Budinsky's, you would say. A last glance at the sky from my mouse hole window, and I'm ensconced between thin sheets and board. No sugarcoating insomnia. I stay awake to startle them, whisper to swan feathers at night, and then in day speak of my sister Pollux. But my mythology's wrong. Pollux was my brother, I'll say, and they in husky tones tisk tisk like metronomes, or censure me outright. Call for another sedative, like Starburst, once my fancy plays itself out, starts to wrinkle in the chest like an old coat, the colonel's mothball coat, covered with dust and powder burns. Relax, Lula. I may be muddled, but my heart's flight extends as the dove in the sky, light years and degrees, and only once or twice reaches an unhappy azimuth. Night. As I draw your coat closer around me, the sky, like castor oil, could drown you, Pollux, once the stars, undone, reveal me, naked as the night. In madness, or not, Lissa. The Attitude Purple Drifts of myrtle blooms plucked off by the squall, edge the muddy street as Lula walks the last few steps from Highland to the trolley stop. Not one of their better visits, with vice so eked of spirit, she seems translucent as powdered milk and water when Lula gets proportions wrong. Tales of new kittens could not rouse her, nor a pocket full of rhymes, nor buttercups bundled with juniper sprigs and fairy wand hide her through the next moon. The kingdom of heaven may be vised one day, but no time soon. Crackling on its wire, the trolley stops her and she boards. As the driver rings the bell, a rush of blossoms startles from the trees. Sympathetic magic. They're still at the asylum, by the way. Sitting together on the swing, Lula offers Vi a poppet. Certain the nurses won't suspect its purpose and throw it out. A crude thing, really, with buttons for eyes, braids of yarn almost their shade of red, and a little stitched X for a mouth. The doll is stuffed with belladonna, bayberry, and St. Benedict's thistle, to forget love, to purify and heal the spirit, to protect against evil. Those herbs, the widow suggested. But Lula has added a sprig of pussy willow to overcome grief, pine for strength, and petals of peony just in case. Not that she believes Vi's gone mad, though her last several letters have hinted at strange tempers and uneasy riddles. 
revealed a wish to be named Lutha. But once a moon calf, always a moon calf, and lunacy is not a never far off in a place like this. Perhaps the doll will work its cure, enough at least to persuade the ghost-like doctors floating beside Vi's bed to send her home. She smiles as she slips the doll in a pocket and begins a song in a language that hovers somewhere beneath the voices of, between the voices of flowers and the timbre of wind. Lula joins in then, and made up words of her own, farning fa fallery, paddling ha ho. Um, towards the end of the story, Lula finds her power as a witch. But unlike the other women in her uh, family, Lula goes dark. Um, and there's a big climax poem that happens not very long after this. So, you know, here's my pitch. If you want to find out what happens, you can uh, go to Amazon and uh, Mad, uh, Madding, uh, Madville Press and buy a copy. This is called Curse. Where she has burnt away the scrub, she draws a five foot wide pentacle and ash and dirt with two points pointing north, the sign of the goat. At each point, a new black beeswax candle she lights in Wittershin, with tacks and needles and nails at their basis to focus power and her pain. She takes the blade, purifies it in each candle flame, then slices her left palm. Ladar, its lines seem to ripple and stir. She presses a cloth around the wound. On parchment, she writes his full name, lists his sins with cold purpose, the page wet with ink, tar black as his soul and her rage. May roaming eyes be crushed to powder, your forked tongue transformed to sand, your fickle heart give way to cinders, that which makes you man unmanned. May the darkest magic use me as I conjure forth this spell. May the devils find you worthy as I will you now to hell. She rips the parchment in five pieces, burns one at each candle, letting ash float or fall at whim. Something of the forest watches, watches as if it wants a clutch of demons to belch forth from the pentacle. But there is only this witch, as she blows the candles out deosil, collects ash, carbon metal, and strands of captured hair in muslin pouches she will bury at Holly Arm, at his home, the rail yard, and around town. The star she leaves to do its work. Thank you. Thank you so much for this very beautiful reading. Victoria Chang's new poetry book, Obit, was published this year and was nominated for the National Book Award and already included on Time Magazine's best book of the year. She has received Guggenheim Fellowship, McDowell Fellowship, Poetry Societies of America, Alice Fady Castignola Award, and her poems have been included in the best American poetry. To this, I will add that Victoria Chang is by far one of my favorite American poets. She is a true original. Each of her books is different from the previous, and yet her overall body of work seems to possess sustained vision, something that is rare among our contemporaries. She is very prolific, able to write in various different genres of poetry, from the novel and verse Barbie Chunk to the linked series of very moving elegies done in prose poem format or beat to the opera-like collection of sonically rich lyrics, the boss, and so on. Her themes range from family to society. She's got the scope, which is to say, 
that her work is both impressively bold and instructive, and yet delicate, tender. Let me talk a bit about the most recent book, a bit. After her mother died, Victoria refused to write elegies. Instead, she still grieved during the period of just two weeks by writing many poetic obituaries for all she lost in the world. In this poem, she reinvents the form of newspaper obituary to both name what has died, divinity, language, America, future, mother's blue dress, and to give it metaphorical scope. She arranges these poems in such a way that they become larger than just a collection of individual lyrics. They tell us what grief is. Let me give you a specific example. Quote, Friendship died June 24, 2009, once beloved, but not consistently beloved. The mirror won the battle. I'm not imprisoned in the mirror. All myself spread out like a deck of cards. Or this, quote, Victoria Chang died unknowingly on June 24, 2009, on I-405 freeway. Born in Motor City, it is fitting she died on the freeway. When her mother called about her father's heart attack, she was living in an independent life. A swallow that they did not dip. This was not her first death. What is this? My mother's teeth died twice, once in 1965, all pulled out from gum disease, once again in August 3rd, 2015. The fake teeth fit in the box in the garage. When she died, I touched them, smelled them. Though I heard a whimper, I showed the teeth into my mouth. As you can see, this is incredibly unreal engine, this world. It is powerful, stunning, but it can also be ecstatic. For example, quote, I blame God. I want to complain to the boss of God about God. What if the boss of God is the rain? And the only way to speak to rain is to open your mouth to the sky. It is unbelievable how powerfully real the poems are. But then, I already told you, Victoria Chang is one of my favorite poets. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? I think they're gonna push. Can you see me okay? Yeah, okay, good. Um, thank you so much. I um, I feel like Ilya should just do the reading of my poem. <laughs> he can read them so much better than me. Um, thank you so much, Ilya, for um, inviting me, for being such a good friend. Um, I know there, there are hard, these are hard times for you, so I, I feel particularly uh, lucky to be able to see your face right now. And um, thank you to Travis Denton. So nice to see you again after three years. Um, and Jameer, is it Jameer Jones? Yeah, congratulations. And um, thanks so much to JC Riley. It's such a pleasure to be able to read with you tonight and to hear you read. And so I, um, you know, I usually, sometimes I like to start reading someone else's poem, and sometimes I like to see whose birthday it is. But today is Sharon Old's birthday, but I couldn't find a Sharon Old's poem quickly enough. And so I found a poem by Tomas Johnstromer. So I'll start with that, if that's okay. If anyone has any trouble hearing me or seeing me, just type in the chat. I can see the chat really well. So this one's called The Half-Finished Heaven, and it's in translation. This one was translated by the uh, the poet Robert uh, Robin Fulton. And um, the other 
and there are a lot of people who, tr who translate Tomas and Stroma. Despondency breaks off its course. Anguish breaks off its course. The vulture breaks off its flight. The eager light streams out. Even the ghosts take a draft. And our paintings see daylight. Our red beasts of the Ice Age studios. Everything begins to look around. We walk in the sun in hundreds. Each man is a half open door leading to a room for everyone. The endless ground under us. The water is shining among the trees. The lake is a window into the earth. So I'm just going to read um, some poems and I will read maybe one from Barbie Chang. It's just at the end of the book. It's called an epistolary poem, which is a letter poem. And then I'll read some poems from Obit and uh, we'll go. We'll see how my time is. I'm timing myself here. This one is called Dear P. Someone will love you. Many will love you. Many will brother you. Some of these loves will bother you. Some will leave you. One might haunt you, hunt you in your sleep, make you weep the tearless kind of weep, the kind of weep that drowns your organs slowly. There are little oars in your body, little boats. Grab onto them and row and row. Someone will tell you no, but you won't know he is right until you have already wrung your own heart dry, your hands dripping knives, until you have already reached your hands into his body and put them through his heart. Love is the only thing that is not an argument. Okay, so I will just read some of these obituary poems and from this book, Obit. Um, and I don't really know if you need to know anything, but I'll just give you a quick and you know intro. My mother passed away from pulmonary fibrosis in 2015. Um, it's a pretty brutal disease. It's when your lung harden and you suffocate to death. And then my dad had a stroke about 12 years ago. So they just pop in and out of these poems um, a lot, actually. <laughs> and uh, like Ilya mentioned, I didn't want to write elegies. I mean, Walt well, Whitman, everyone's done it better than me. So there was really no reason for me to write elegies. And then um, I was listening to NPR on the radio in the car one day, and they're talking about a documentary maker um, or a documentary about obituary writers. And um, I don't know, something about that made me just start writing the very first, first poem in this book um, called My Father's Frontal Lobe, but I won't read that. I'll start with, um, I'll start with memory. And they look like little, if you can see, they look like little obituaries. Memory, died August 3rd, 2015. The death was not sudden, but slowly over a decade. I wonder if, when people die, they hear a bell, or if they taste something sweet, or if they feel a knife cutting them in half, dragging through the flesh like sheet cake. The caretaker who witnessed my mother's death quit. She holds the memory and images, and now they're gone. For the rest of her life, the memories are hers. She said my mother couldn't breathe then took her last breath 20 seconds later. The way I have imagined a kiss with many men I have never kissed. My memory of my mother's death can't be a memory, but is an imagination. Each time the wind blows, leaves unfurl a little differently. Um, this one is called Friendships. Friendships died June 24, 2009, once beloved, but not consistently beloved. The mirror won the battle. I'm now imprisoned in the mirror, all myself spread out like a deck of cards. It's true, the grieving speak a different language. I'm separated from my friends by gauze. I'll drive myself to my own house for the party. I'll make small talk with myself, fill a drink on myself. When it's over, I'll drive myself back to my own house. My conversations with other parents about children pass me on the way up the staircase and repeat on the way down. Before my mother's death, I sat anywhere. 
Now I look for the image of the empty chair near the image of the empty table. An image is a kind of distance. An image of me sits down. Depression is a glove over the heart. Depression is an image of a glove over the image of the heart. And so Ilya had also kind of read a little bit about um, the, my mother's teeth. And I don't know if anyone has dentures or if anyone knows anyone with dentures, but uh, my mother had dentures. And so there are always um, teeth everywhere. Like they'd, they'd always be sitting in a glass um, soaking in something fizzy. And then there'd be like old teeth lying around. So there'd be like teeth everywhere. So this one's called My Mother's Teeth. My mother's teeth died twice, once in 1965, all pulled out from gum disease. Once again, on August 3rd, 2015, the fake teeth sit in a box in the garage. When she died, I touched them, smelled them, thought I heard a whimper. I shoved the teeth into my mouth, but having two sets of teeth only made me hungrier. When my mother died, I saw myself in the mirror, her words around my mouth like powder from a donut. Her last words were in English. She asked for a Sprite. I wonder whether her last thought was in Chinese. I wonder what her last thought was. I used to think that a dead person's words die with them. Now I know that they scatter, looking for meaning to attach to like a scent. My mother used to collect orange blossoms in a small, shallow bowl. I passed the tree each spring. I always knew that grief was something I could smell, but I didn't know that it's not actually a noun, but a verb, that it moves. So, um, so I wrote these in about a two week period and I wrote about, I don't know, 75 or 80 of these and, um, and then just stopped. I think I got tired, <laughs> literally, and tired of, of these. And then, um, I, and I, I can't remember at some point I started writing a bunch of, uh, formal poems like sonnets and, um, villanelles and sestinas. I love the sestina, guzzles, um, and, I wrote, I landed on some tankas as well. They're 57577. Seven, seven. They're sort of expanded haikus. And I actually put them in, I remember this, I actually, I tell the story a lot and uh, it's funny because Ilya's here, but I put them in the back of this manuscript and Ilya was like, mm, these, no, these aren't so good. And, but, but these tankas, you should keep these tankas. And in fact, you should um, sprinkle them throughout the manuscript. And so, um, that's what I did. And I think the tankas are in um, pairs. They're like little, little couples and they are talking to children and all children kind of thing. So I'll just read two pair or four, four total right now. At least. Um, and they're incredibly difficult to write if you've ever tried writing in syllabics because, um, you know, you might come up with this beautiful line that you love, but it's it's one syllable too many and then you have to start all over. I tell my children that hope is like a blue skirt. It can twirl and twirl, that men like to open it, take it apart, and wound it. I tell my children that sometimes I too can hope, that sometimes nothing moves but my love for someone and the light from the dead star. Do you see the tree? Its secrets grow as lemons. Sometimes I pretend I love my children more than words. No one knows this but words. My children, children, today my hands are dreaming. They touch your hair. Your hair turns into winter. When I die, your hair will snow. Um, so I'll just read a few more of these obits. And this one is called grief. Grief, as I knew it, died many times. It died trying to reunite with other lesser deaths. Each morning, I lay out my children's clothing to cover their grief. The grief remains, but is changed by what it is covered with. A picture of oblivion is not the same as oblivion. 
My grief is not the same as my pain. My mother was a mathematician, so I tried to calculate my grief. My father was an engineer, so I tried to build a box around my grief, along with a small wooden bed that grief could lie down on. The texts kept interrupting my grief, forcing me to speak about nothing. If you cut out a rectangle of a perfectly blue sky, no clouds, no wind, no birds, frame it with a blue frame, place it face up on the floor of an empty museum with an open atrium to the sky. That is grief. Um, this one is called the blue dress. So I'll read maybe like, uh, maybe three more of these and then I'll read a couple more tanka. There, and then we'll be done. The blue dress died on August 6, 2015, along with the little blue flowers, all silent. Once the petals looked up, now small pieces of dust. I wonder whether they burned the dress or just the body. I wonder who lifted her up into the fire. I wonder if her hair brushed his cheek before it grew into a bonfire. I wonder what sound the body made as it burned. They dyed her hair for the funeral, too black. She looked like a comic character. I waited for the next comic panel to see the speech bubble and what she might say. But her words never came, and we were left with a stillness of blown glass, the irreversibility of rain, and millions of little blue flowers. Imagination is having to live in a dead person's future. Grief is wearing a dead person's dress forever. So, um, oh, this one I was listening to NPR another time, um, which is funny, I don't really listen to NPR very often. It seems like I, all I do is listen to NPR, which is not true. Um, I, I was listening to NPR and this, this person who has Alzheimer's was a scientist and he was trying to explain how to read a clock and it was fascinating. Um, so this one's called The Clock. The clock died on June 24th, 2009, and it was untimely. How many times my father has failed the clock test? Once I heard a scientist with Alzheimer's on the radio trying to figure out why he could no longer draw a clock. It had to do with the superposition of three types. The hours represented by one to 12, the minutes where one no longer represents one but five, and a two now represents 10, then the second hand that measures one to 60. I sat at the stoplight and thought of the clock, its perfect circle and its superpositions, all the layers of complication on a plane of thought. Yet the healthy read the clock in one single instant without a second thought. I think about my father and his lack of first thoughts, how every thought is a second or third or fourth thought, unable to locate the first most important thought. I wonder about the man on the radio and how far his brain has degenerated since. Marvel at how far our brains allow language to wander without looking back, but knowing where the peer is. If you unfold an origami swan and flatten the paper, is the paper sad because it has seen the shape of the swan or does it aspire toward flatness, a life without creases? My father is the paper. He remembers the swan, but can't name it. He no longer knows the paper swan represents an animal swan. His brain is the water the animal swan once swam in, holds everything. But when thawed, all the fish disappear. Most of the words we say have something to do with fish. And when they're gone, they're gone. So this is the only poem that I wrote that was a prompt. 
Um, so I give prompts all day long and I, I actually hate writing them myself or writing towards prompts, but I give, you know, I, I, I have trouble writing what other people tell me to do. Um, I have trouble doing what other people tell me to do, to be honest. And so, um, this poem is part of terrain.org's, um, series on Dear America. And so they have a whole series on like poems and essays and whatever anybody can write a dear america anything you want really so the editor asked me to write uh, a dear america obit um which i didn't do initially i refused to do it because i couldn't figure out how to do it and then i thought oh why not give it a try so i put it um at the it's a penultimate poem in the book i put it uh, right in the towards the end and the only piece of information is um that the i mention the marjorie stoneman high school in florida the shooting in this poem America died on February 14, 2018, and my dead mother doesn't know. Since her death, America has died a series of small deaths, each one less precise than the next. My tears are now shaped like hooks, but my heart is damp still. If it is lucky, it is in the middle of its beats. The unlucky dead children hold telegrams they must hand to a woman at a desk. The woman will collect their belongings in shadows. My dead mother asks each of these children if they know me, have seen me, how tall my children are now. They will tell her that they once lived in Florida, not California. She will see the child with a hole in his head. She will blow the dreams out of the hole like dust. I used to think death was a kind of anesthesia. Now I imagine long lines my mother taking in all the children. I imagine her touching their hair, how she might tickle their knees to make them laugh. The dead hold the other half of our ticket. The dead are an image of wind. And when they comb their hair, our trees rustle. And I will end, let me check my time. Okay, perfect. I'll end with um, just the last poem in the book. And they're just two pairs of, they're one pair, not two pair. They're one pair of tankas. I'm ready to admit I love my children. To admit this is to admit that they will die. Die. No one knows this but words. My children, children, this poem will not end because I'm trying to end this poem with hope. 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 See how the mouth stays open? Thank you. Oh, wow, JC Victoria. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, frankly, I didn't want either of you to stop reading. <laughs> so I, I love it when that happens. And thank you so much for being here tonight. And and Ilya, I, thank you for with wonderful introductions as well. I, I, I got to say, um, insightful uh, poetry in and of themselves. And, and I've heard you say it before that uh, you believe introductions to be like love letters. And... That's so true. You you make that real. Uh, so thank you for that. And and so why don't we end the way that we uh, usually end poetry at tech events, and that's with a gratitude. That's with gratitude. And and first off, I want to thank Team Poetry at Tech, our our squad, uh, which includes Iskanda Prasad. He is our wizard, our tech wizard. He presses all the buttons. He makes everything. Happen. Um, in front of and behind the scenes. So thank you, Skanda. And then Bianca Bordianu, uh for all the hats that you wear and uh, making us look so good on social media. So uh, thank you very much uh, for that. And of course, uh, Steve Hodges and all the gang at Ivan Allen College OIT, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and of course, uh, we have to thank our, our fearless leader and chair of the School of Literature, Media and Communication, uh, Richard Utz. For, uh, for support of the arts at Georgia Tech and uh, and poetry at Tech for so long. We really appreciate you. Thanks for being out front for us. We need you. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we have, uh, folks, we have uh, people from Mexico. I mentioned Orlando, Kansas, all over the place. So thank you for being here. If this is your 
first Poetry Attack event. I, I hope you'll come again. And uh, we're going to get cranked up again in the spring. Uh, sadly, this is our final Poetry Attack event of the fall, but we're going to get going in February with Natalie Diaz. And, and uh, we have a wonderful group of poets uh, that uh, we'll announce very soon on the Poetry Attack website. So I hope you'll be uh, checking that out. And, of course, uh, follow us on Twitter and, and Instagram. We'd love that. Um, check out uh, the Poetry at Tech website for all things Poetry at Tech. But until then, wishing you all well, stay safe, and, of course, only good things always. Thank you, JC. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Ilya. Bye, JC. Bye, Travis.